Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Saving Grace Lutheran Church on this 21st Sunday after Pentecost. And as we are continuing to walk through our series on Hebrews, we look today at Christ is greater than our faith. Uh, my prayer for you today is that you might walk away encouraged in the Word of God, both spoken and sung this morning, in knowing that our confidence rests in Christ and His resurrection. Uh, this morning we will follow the order of service as you have it printed out for you in your bulletin today. Uh, before we jump in and praise our Lord with our first hymn, let's greet one another as we've come together as a family of Christ this morning.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us forsake all trust in earthly gain and find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we'll turn our attention to the words of the Lord today. Um, let me ask you this, because I know that with this group especially, you guys are all good at being heard. Yeah? Yeah. When you want uh, to be known or you want someone to know what you're thinking or you need to make an announcement, how do you do it? I mean, maybe it's different. What do you do, Carson? Okay, you raise your hand. That's good. And then you say it. Yeah? What do you do, INR? Okay, okay, very polite, yeah. Does anybody, when you're at home and no one's listening to you, you yell at the top of your lungs? Uh Uh-huh, that's what I thought, yeah. So so sometimes we do things because we want to get heard, right? And and that's okay. So uh, today, I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, We're not going to look at the gospel lesson. It was a great gospel lesson this morning. But instead, I'm going to jump to a passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And in this passage... Here's, here's, here's what the Apostle Paul says about letting people know what's going on. Uh, he said this, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now, you're going to learn a Greek word this morning. You ready for it? All right, it's kruxete. Repeat after me. Kruxete. There you go. Now, what that means is to preach the word. And actually, it was the picture of a heralder or someone that would stand in the town square and say, today is Sunday, next weekend, sail on pork chops. That's what preach meant, was to declare that and to say it. Now, what Paul was saying is we have a message to declare. Yeah. Now, the reason I bring that up is because if you guys look around the front of church, do you notice anything different? (laughs) Yeah. There's doors right there. Why do we have front doors in church? You know, Ethan? Yes. So uh, October 31st is, I know it's Halloween, but it's also Reformation Day. And that was the day. Do you know what happened? Okay, close. It wasn't Martin Luther King. Martin Luther, that's who Martin Luther King was named after. But uh, yeah, that's okay. I know what you're saying. And he put some things on the church door. Why did he nail it to the church door? (laughs) <laughs> that's weird like was it like graffiti like he was like go home everyone no yeah it, so at that time instead of a guy who announced it in the in the city square the church doors were like the announcement board so if you lost your dog you would put it up on the church doors if you wanted something to know you put it up on the church door so people would let people know kind of like preaching the word but they were getting their messages out of what was going on. So Martin Luther did that that day, and he said, um, there's some things we're doing wrong in church, and we need to talk about this. And that's what he put on the doors that day so that the gospel message could be clearly heard. So what we're going to do this morning is, as we remember God's call for us to share... He's got an opportunity. We have Oktoberfest coming up on Saturday. Could you invite someone to that? Yeah, right? Could you help out with that? Yeah, and then even better, we have Reformation Sunday where we're going to sing and we're going to praise our Lord. Could you invite someone to that too? Yeah, exactly. So we're going to make the announcement so that everybody can come hear the gospel. Now, you guys are lucky this morning because since you're here, does anyone want to post an announcement on the church door? Okay, you can put this one that says, Free House Cleaning, see the confirmation class. This one is Lost Dog, and I drew a picture of my dog. Um, here, let's put up, I'll give you, you want to put one up? Okay, this is for Advent worship services coming up on Wednesdays in December. This is for the pie competition coming up in November. And let's see, let's put another one. Oh, here, Advent by Candlelight. That's for the ladies worshiping in December. And let's, we better put an Oktoberfest one up there too. And this is for Oktoberfest coming up. All right. Let's pray, and then you guys, there's nails on the door. Just push it onto the nail, and then you can... Hold on, let's pray first, and then you guys can go back to your seats after we're done. 
Dear Lord and Savior, thank you for giving us a message to declare to others. May we let everybody know the grace and the love that we've been shown by you so that all may know the forgiveness we have in you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, everybody. You guys can find a nail up there and stick it in there. Just push it on. You don't... Yeah, you want a different one? Yeah, here, here you go. Church cleanup day, there you go. You don't want free house cleaning for... One of these days we're going to put that one up there. There you go. Very nice. Good lost dog. Did you find the, uh, some more nails up there? Perfect. All right. Thanks, guys. Well done. Good job. Uh, this morning, <clears throat> let's continue on by joining together and singing our psalm of the day. And our psalm of the day, you'll find it actually in the, in the blue hymn books. Uh, it is hymn number... 552 Psalm 23 the king of love so it's in your your blue hymn books not in the Psalters although I think you can find it in there too but it's hymn number 552 Psalm 23 the king of love let's join together in singing that My family in Christ, uh, if you've been following along, we are walking through the book of Hebrews and getting dangerously close to the end. Uh, we are on all the way at the end of Hebrews, the last half of Hebrews chapter 11. And if you have, it's not too late, if you get a chance and haven't read through it, read through the chapters, you'll see a certain amount of repetition that comes up in there. Um, there are some very striking features about the book of Hebrews. Another thing that you'll notice is both the admonition and the encouragement that the author brings to it. 
Um, one of the beautiful parts of Hebrews and what makes it very unique is that it actually ties together uh, w with Christ, the, the New Testament and the Old Testament, these themes that run all the way through the Bible. If you have a grasp on the themes that run in the book of Hebrews, you really understand the entire Bible and the heart of Christianity as well. But it's not necessarily a book written to defend the faith, uh, to explain the faith. It's really a, a, a letter of pastoral comfort is what it is. And I think this is especially where it connects with 21st century Christians. Because what it does is it, it, it speaks to people who are beat up, who are fed up, who are having a tough time. It, it, it speaks to people who are in a chaotic life in which there is a ton of change happening all the time. And it, it speaks to people who have, are distracted or just, just ready to give up. And so you see these themes coming through again and again. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, it says, pay more careful attention to what we've heard so we don't drift away. He encourages us our faith in chapter 3 where he says, uh, fix your thoughts on Jesus. In chapter 4 when he says, um, uh, let us hold firmly to the faith that we have. And along with that, he not only says, hold on to the faith that you have, but then it, it permeates in how we treat other people. So he says, let us not give up meeting together as we are in the habit of doing. He, he says in chapter 4, he encourages us to encourage one another. And so this relationship of love and, and not giving up speaks to us even today. And so now as we get to, uh, after 10 chapters of explaining why Jesus is better and why to hold on and why to treat one another and encourage one another in this chaotic world, he gets to all of chapter 11, which gives us this example of, okay, how, so how do you do that, right? How do you live in a chaotic world? What do you do when life throws things at you that you have no control over? What, what do you do when you feel like giving up? And in the last half of chapter 11, after defining what faith is, he gives us uh, what you might call the secret sauce of the Christian faith and, 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 and the strength that it gives to us. So what we're going to do is look at the last half of, of chapter 11. We're going to focus mostly on uh, verse 32 down through the end. And as we do, we're going to look at what it is that God equips us with for anything that the life can throw at us, and then how do we get that. What I'd like you to do, and feel free to follow along in your sermon notes or in your Bibles today, I just want to read just verse 35. Uh, Mr. Rogers did a great job of reading through those verses from the last half of Hebrews chapter 11. I want to just look at verse 35, and if there's any verse that you circle in your Bibles, this is one uh, where we get this encouragement from the Word of God. Verse 35, the writer to the book of Hebrews, the writer to the people, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews says this in chapter 11, verse 35. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. So far the word of God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, strengthen us in your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. What, what is it that has given Christians for the last 2,000 years and also us, what is it that that gives us the strength to not give up, in, even in a very chaotic world, even to the point of death. Uh, it might be easier to look at maybe what it's not as we go through. Chapter 11 gives us a definition of faith, and uh, chapter 11, verse 1, is that the penultimate ex example of what faith is, but it's a little bit vague. And so what the author does then is give us 40 verses of people who are examples of faith. And so we looked last week at what faith was. It, it's personal, it's foundational, it's full of grace. It's rational, all of those things. But here in the last half of chapter 11, it, it somewhat defines what it's not. You'll notice he shifts gears, the author does, and he says, here, here's what you need if you are going to spit in the face of the world, so to speak, if you're going to take on whatever it throws at you. And he, he starts by listing off basically the Marvel action figures of the Old Testament. Did you notice that? He starts listing off all of the great stories. If you grew up a little Jewish boy or girl, these were the action figures that you would have played with. And you probably remember them. It was it's an awesome list as you go through the, the, the story of Samson where he was kind of the bad boy and then got himself in trouble. But at the end, he defeats the Philistines and <coughs> he has some, 
some vague responses in there. He talks about the guy whose uh, the lion's mouths were shut. You all know who that was. Daniel, right? Daniel was one of the few guys in the Old Testament that never, as far as we know, did anything that was majorly bad. We, we saw Daniel's buddies. He talked about those guys that, that stood in the fiery furnace. You remember Shadrach and Benny, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who stood in the fire and survived. And he, it goes on to talk about all of these heroes of faith. And then in verse 35, which is a rather pivotal point in here, it talks about the last two huge stories of the Old Testament. And it kind of brushes over them a little bit quickly, but it talks about women who received back from the dead someone that they dearly love. Yeah, now don't skip that too fast. There are two accounts in the Old Testament of sons who came back from the dead. And it was during this period of time in Israel where God, he, he just let a whole barrage of miracles loose. First it was with Elisha, and he brought back the, the, the widow of Zane's son, right? And then Elijah, uh, sorry, Elijah first, and then Elisha, his predecessor, who brought back the son of a, a Shunammite woman. In, in both cases, their sons had died, and they were brought back from the dead. Now, there's kind of a common theme through all of those names that were listed and he even says we don't have time to talk about all of these great things and part of it was as he said we see everyone that started out with in, in a position of weakness and then ended up great in whatever it was whether it was fighting battles whether it was justice bringing back from the dead whatever it was it was these great stories of miraculous save it was the kind of stories that we love right that we that we that we listen to and we say yes god came through in the clincher and he did a miracle at the last minute and boom everything was great and we we celebrate these are great stories we celebrate these even in today's world right i'm guessing that a lot of you probably know someone myself included uh, someone that was diagnosed with a, a terminal illness right and they had gone and the doctors had done everything within the medical world that they could they were people of faith and six months later it was gone and they went back to the doctors and the doctors said it's a miracle, right? This victory that we've had, and we attribute it to our faith, yeah. Or uh, you think of it even in the, in the business world, and there's all kinds of stories like this, and they're wonderful stories. Somebody that starts out a, a Christian businessman that s sits on his ideals, he doesn't want to fade with anything, and, and through adversity and everything else, God makes him incredibly successful. You, you think of the Chick-fil-A story, uh, the Hobby Lobby story, all of these things, and they're all wonderful stories about where the started in weakness, but God through a miraculous way with strength. The problem with that is, is this chapter doesn't end with just people who through their faith in a miracle were successful, right? The problem with that is you can't stop reading on the first half of verse 35. And as you probably caught it, because there's a whole second half to that, right? Look at verse 35, and, and here's, here's what it says, and here's where he brings it out. He says, there were others, middle of verse 35. And this is the beginning of a list that is a bit gruesome. There were others who were tortured. They were refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Okay, all right, so uh, author to the Hebrews, here's wh where are we going with this, right? He starts by listing off, there were others. There were others that didn't have a miracle. There were others that were not victorious. There were others that were tortured. There was others that wandered. There was others that lost. There was others whose illness wasn't cured. There was others that died poor. There was others that it would seem, whether they had faith or not, they were not victorious. What, where are you going with this second half? I imagine... Imagine if you were visiting someone in a hospital and you took the same kind of tact that the author of Hebrews did. Someone that had a terminal illness and you said, listen, I, you know, have faith. The Lord's going to pull you through. Uh, I, I know someone that in a miraculous way was cured of, of everything that they had. We give all the glory to God. But I know like six other people that died. Right? Like what kind of message would that be? And yet, look at what he's saying. He's saying that some were victorious in the Lord, but others were not. And then he talks about because they might gain an even better resurrection. This is probably a, a reference that not a lot of us are going to get. So remember that he was speaking to those that probably grew up as little Jewish boys or girls. And, and the particular story that he's referring to, he had just gotten done talking about two women 
whose sons had been raised from the dead, right? Those are great stories of the Old Testament. And then he talks about others who were tortured and died. You know where that story comes from? So there is, um, uh, between the Old Testament, the last book of the Bible, uh, to when Jesus came, the first book of the New Testament, there's about 400 years. It's often called the intertestamental period. And there were some books of history that were written about God's people during that period of time. That's a whole other discussion. But uh, one of them is 2 Maccabees, if you've ever heard of it. In 2 Maccabees chapter 7, there is an account of eight people, a woman and her seven sons, who all died for their faith. Now, the, the account, you can look it up if you want to. You can find it online. The account is so gruesome that I would not even repeat it here, but this is essentially what happened. After Israel was no longer a country, there was one country after another that ruled over them. At this particular time, there was a Syrian king by the name of Antichius Epiphanes. He was particularly cruel, and the Syrian kings had this reputation to keep everybody in order. They would take prominent families. They would torture them and kill them. And then so nobody else would rebel. And this is what this king did. He took these seven sons and their mother and put them out in the public square. And they, he said this, give up your faith, right? And the litmus test was they had to eat pork. This is a true story. Had to eat pork, give up your faith, declare me as king, and I will let you go. Otherwise, I will kill you and torture you. And that's what he did. Every one of the sons died because they said, I would rather be judged by God than by God you all the way down to the mother and for every one of those sons this, this is what the mother encouraged her kid this is crazy right this is crazy she said to every one of her kids she said listen i didn't make you i didn't create you you were knitted together in my womb what that means is they can take anything they want their tongue the eyes hands feet your life but the one who gave you life can give him back to you again. In other words, it doesn't matter what this world takes from you. It can take everything that you possibly can imagine, including your life. But if God gave it to you once, he can give it to you again, the second resurrection. You see what she was saying? The secret sauce that faith gives us is not that we are always victorious. Not just because we have faith we're going to win, but there's others that lose in this world but the hope that we have is not this world but the second resurrection the fact that if God has given us everything that we have and this world takes it away there is no reason why he cannot give it to us again right apply that just put that into our practical life I, I think that sometimes what we do is we get ourselves into trouble when we don't look through it and our faith is, is, is in something other than the second resurrection that the Lord has promised us. Think of it. And maybe you've been here before. Uh, maybe you've heard people say this before. But sometimes what we say is, well, I, I would trust in God, but I asked him, I prayed for him, I wanted something to happen, something in my life, and he didn't come through. So I, I'm a little disappointed with him. Or I've heard it on the other side before too. I somebody is suffering from an illness and they pray and they pray and they pray and it doesn't go away and so people say well you don't have enough faith right if you had more faith then you would cure whatever is ailing you but see that's the problem what that is that's not faith in God or what he can do that's faith in our agenda for God that's faith in what I think needs to be done in my life because I know better than God that's faith in saying Lord this is what I want you to do so now you need to do it and you can fill in the blank Lord I I need to be healed I Lord, I need more money. I need a husband. I need more hair on my head. Whatever it may be, it's our agenda for God, but not what God says. Understand, this, this is what he's talking about with the second resurrection. It's not our faith, but what our faith is in. Picture Christ at one point in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Probably at his lowest point as he knows he is about to suffer for the sins of the world, and he sits there and he prays, and you can almost see him referring back to all of those Old Testament heroes. Lord, I know what's coming up. If we could do this, like, like King David, like Samson, if, if, if this could turn out like the three men in the fiery furnace, or like Daniel, if we could do it that way where I could be victorious, that would be awesome. <laughs> but that wasn't how God did it. And that's not how Jesus ended his prayer. Instead, he said, Lord, your will be done 
And he, like those, was the others who looked in death to have died for the sins of the world. See, this is what God has given to us in our faith so that through Christ's death and resurrection, we have the second resurrection. This is what our faith is in. Apply that to our lives now. What does that mean? What that means is that God has given us his assurance, not in this life, but in what's to come. What are you afraid of? This is really what it comes down to, the entire book of Hebrews, right? What are you afraid of for tomorrow? I, I would imagine something's probably running through your head. What are you afraid of in the next week, right? Elections are coming up. What are you afraid of in the next month? Someone told me they were afraid of the zombie apocalypse. Not going to happen, but people are afraid of things, right? What are you afraid of? When we look at what the Lord has promised to us, this is his promise. There is nothing that God has already given to you that he cannot give you again, including your life. There is nothing that God has given to us that he can't give again. This is why even in the Old Testament, uh, Job, you remember him, suffered at one point as he is in his misery, and everything was taken away except for his life and his nagging wife, right? He looks up into heaven and he says, listen, Lord, I know this. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that one day I will look on him with my own flesh and blood, and I will see him face to face. Second resurrection, right? That's why some of the greatest hymns that we have have been penned on those words. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living head. And if you go on and sing all eight verses in our hymnal, there's 12, I believe, all together. We don't have them all in there. Verse 5 says this. He lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to impart. Don't be afraid. Christ is bigger than your faith. And he promises to give us all things through him. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning as we come into the house of God, let's confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, and you'll find those on page 6 in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for... <coughs> the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, at this time, if you brought an offering, feel free to leave it in the offering plate at the entrance to the sanctuary, either now or sometime after the service. Also, if you're a guest or a visitor with us this morning, please give us your information so we can keep in touch with you on the Connect card on the back of your pew. And if anyone would like to leave a prayer request, please put that on the back of that Connect card and 
hand it to one of the ushers and we'll include it within our prayer of the church today. Uh, we'll now uh, go to our Lord and uh, go to him in private prayer as we listen to our musicians as they offer up a musical offering. Thank you, Sydney and Jennifer. Great words. Great words. We pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, this morning we ask that you would pour out your spirit on us that we may grow in our knowledge and our love for you. Uh, help us to dig in richly into your word so that we may be built up and encourage others. Lord, whether our lives seem victorious or in defeat, we know that you have given us victory in Christ. Lord, let that be our guiding principle as we endure hardships and sometimes the willingness or the want to, to give up. Lord, be with us and keep us close to you in all things. Today, Lord, we also especially pray for all of those who are sick or who are sorrowing or who are anxious. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are suffering or in tribulation. We especially ask, Lord, your guiding hand in the Reed family as they celebrate Becky's father's victory in Christ. In the midst of their tears, remind them of the eternal life and the second resurrection that we have through you. Lord, uh, uh, Lord, we thank you for all of the blessings that you have given us, the successful surgery with Lorna. Continue to heal her. We thank you, Lord, that you have walked with Charlie and Heather in their struggle with cancer. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to be with Karen as she struggles with long COVID. Lord, this morning we also keep in our prayers uh, Aunt Mary, who broke her ankle, be with her. 
that she may heal to continue to bring you grace and glory in her life. And Lord, we thank you for a cancer-free uh, declaration of Lena's volleyball coach's dad. God, Lord, you are good and gracious in all things. Finally, Lord, we ask your blessing on all of those relationships that you bring into our lives, but especially in marriage, and we ask that you not only continue to bless Marna and Robert, but we thank you deeply for the love that they have shared and the blessings that they have been on our lives as well. Lord, watch over them and keep them close to you as you draw them close to one another. These things we pray, Lord, and we ask them in your Son's name. Amen. Let's join together in the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue with the responsive words on page 8 in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join in their glorious song. And let's join together in holy, holy, holy. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated, and let's join together in singing, O Christ, Lamb of God. blessing of our Lord and our Savior. Please stand. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated. 
morning we're learning a, a new hymn for the month of October, which is also Reformation Month. And so we're going to join together in singing the Reformation song, hymn number 877, the Reformation song. Let's sing verses 1 to 4. We'll say verse 5 for Reformation Day. Uh, in your blue hymn books, hymn number 877, the Reformation song. <laughs> 